at extremely short notice. I didn't have any time to prepare and refresh my memory about the Falklands conflict. So as a result of this, I interrupt the guest several times during the interview, for which I apologise. But hopefully that doesn't detract too much from today's interview. This week I am pleased to welcome back on the show an academic, peace activist and truth campaigner. In previous programmes we have discussed his extensive research into the false flag attack which was the 7-7 London bombings. In 1986 he co-edited the book The Unnecessary War covering the 1982 Falklands War and the sinking of the Argentine ship the Belgrano. We are fast approaching the 30th anniversary of this war so welcome Nick Collistrom. <laughs> now then Nick, um, if we just consider the current geopolitical situation with, with uh, obviously America's seemingly their goal for world domination and, and our um, Britons seems to just follow them. Uh, a lot of people call our military just the poodle of, of America. Now, this is one reason why the, Argen, the, the Falklands Island situation seems to be quite significant, because America is not backing Britain in, in, in this Falkland situation. Is that, is, would you say that's correct? Right. It's, it's, uh, it's now started calling the Falklands the Malvinas Islands, and it's said Britain only has a de facto right to be there. That's not de jure. So it's not admitting that Britain has a right to the Falklands. So just, just and, it's, and it's mandating Britain and, 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 and the Argentines to negotiate. Right. Which so is, what, uh, what's the difference between those two terms, Nick? Just explain well, uh, that. Well, if it had a de jure, it would mean it had, Britain had a right to be on the Falklands, what Britain tries to argue. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Argentines don't accept that. They said, we just grab the Falklands and uh, it should be in some way uh, shared. Uh, or, or Argentina has some kind of right to the Falklands. So this is the highly disputed area, which I don't think we'll ever get a clear answer about. And America agrees with Argentina on that, then? Well, it, it's saying there needs to be negotiations, that there is something that Britain needs to negotiate, and it can't just keep this attitude of, oh, they're ours, and uh, that's it. Mm -hmm. And was that America's stance in 1982 when this conflict bro broke out? Well, America didn't want that war at all, because it was uh, two allies. but. Uh, in the last analysis, America sided with Britain, and, and we could only win that war because it gave us some nice missiles we could use and its, its, uh, its technology of uh, intercepting messages and so on uh, and refueling. We were totally dependent on America for fighting that war. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, 8,000 miles away uh, now, Britain has not got the military to defend that island again if, if it should need be. So were America not late in entering that war, Nick, or did they, as far as I remember, Reg was it Reagan was in, was in power? He didn't support Thatcher immediately, did he? Well, all the time, when the, the task force was sent out, uh, Al Haig was uh, trying to get a peace deal. All Al the Haig time, is, the, was the, the American, American Foreign Secretary. Y y yeah. Uh, he was trying to get with Margaret Thatcher a peace deal, what would satisfy both sides, and then during the key weekend, once the task force arrived there, at the end of uh, April, they put down this 200-mile exclusion zone, which is very important for our, our story. Anything inside it would be sunk. That was mm -hmm. a clear warning gave to Argentina. But there wasn't a general war because there was uh, peace negotiations going on and both sides said they wanted to get a peace deal. And during that weekend, Francis Pym, that's the British Foreign Secretary in Al Haig, were negotiating in Washington, and they thought they'd got a deal. And they were in telephone conversation with these people in Peru. There was intense negotiations over the whole weekend at Peru uh, and uh, with the British ambassador and the Ar Ar Argentine uh, prime minister. So, so w what, this was in 1982, w what... Uh, month was this in, Nick? Uh, April, the task force sailed, a huge task force of sails right. uh, from Britain. And so when, just just go through the, the timeline of it then, Nick. I mean, w okay, at, well, at what March, point did it come on the radar as being a problem? At the end of March, Margaret Thatcher announced that this had come out of the blue, that suddenly the Argentines had taken over uh, Port Stanley. So and what, militarily? Were, yeah, yeah. So, no. the, so, was it, so, so, so the mainstream media was saying there's been a surprise attack on the Falklands yeah. and, and we've, we've got helpless British people there whose yeah. lives are at risk. Sort yeah, of thing. that okay. was the whole thing, uh, invasion, and, and we've got to defend. If you look back at what actually happened, 
there, was, uh, there were negotiations going on between Britain and Argentina which were supposed to get somewhere. The UN has said, as an end to colonialism, there must be some sort of shared agreement. And, 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 and what was the time scale of those negotiations? Well, let's was that say, prior to this? Yeah, let's say a couple of months, January, February, All right. prior to the war. And basically Britain didn't want those negotiations to get anywhere. It was not negotiating in good faith. They just wanted to use a whole lot of amenities from the uh, Argentine mainland, but to keep the island totally British in perpetuity. Uh, so they thought there was nothing to negotiate about, and I think that was one of the causes for the war. And then there was a funny business with some, um, uh, some uh, scrap metal dealers on, on Georgia, which was said to be trying to take over the island. But actually they were British, British employed, we've since found out, and they didn't have any sort of guns or anything. Uh, and it was so a bit of a manufactured this is, this story. This is the initial story where they said that the Argentine, Argentina had invade, well, took over the island. Mm -hmm. said, you're saying that wasn't true? Well, just uh, what, uh, there wasn't a government decision to invade. That did not happen. An Argentine the, government Argentine decision. Argentine government decision. There, there was uh, this kerfuffle with some uh, uh, scrap metal dealers on, on the island who were alleged to be uh, being disruptive, and then uh, and then both sides started responding, and the Argentines thought there was provocation for sending some ships over to see what was happening. And then the Argentine military, who were out of control from the government, started uh, sending their ships over there, and then an invasion ha had, had happened, which the Argentine government wasn't really able to control, and eventually it had to support. Don't forget, this is the 100th anniversary of... Uh, a big claim of now 150th anniversary of a big claim of sovereignty of Las Malvinas. So, so, so let me get this right. So it wasn't disputed on any side that the Argentine ships went to the Falkland Islands and came on the land and and sorted out some kind of situation. Yeah, yeah. But it's just whether that was just a completely unsolicited attack or whether it was some other event which triggered it. Is that what you're saying? Y yeah. Mm -hmm. So what was that event that triggered th the Argentines coming on to... That was to uh, s some scrap metal dealers <laughs> who were employed by a British company and were not armed, as it simply turns out, uh, and uh, they were, whatever they're trying to do, it was alleged that they were behaving wrongly and were in some way a threat to the island. This right. is on, on South Georgia, right. one of the Falkland Islands. Uh, and. Uh, and Rex Hunt, the um, British representative there, uh, tried to make out that they were invading. Uh, and it was reported in the British press as if this were an invasion. Uh, so there was a kind of provocation. Uh, all, all, I'm not, all I'm saying is that uh, this, was, this wasn't just the Argentine government deciding to invade uh, the Falkland Islands. Right. It was independent. This was a military act and independently. And did yeah. I, I'm not sure of the story. Um, I was 14 at the time that this happened. I, I remember it, um, but not in any great detail. So when the Argentine ships got there, did they take any hostages, or did they did they fire any weapons, or did they what what did they actually do uh, when, when when they supposedly well, took over the island? Well, no, no, nobody was, nobody was people were not killed. Uh, it was Argentine takeover of the islands. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and they then appealed to Britain to help, yeah, right. and, and Thatcher did. Who appealed for Britain uh, to help? The people of the islands? Yes. Right, okay. So, so you, uh, do you suspect that that was some kind of false flag event then, to, to, to trigger that or not? Well, not really, but I'm saying that there are two sides to the problem. Right. Britain needed that war, firstly because Margaret Thatcher's popularity was at absolute rock bottom, and she wouldn't, there's no way she would have got re-elected, and secondly, the Navy was facing very severe cuts, and mm -hmm. it needed a bit of action to show the British people why it was, okay. uh, why it should fend off now, those cuts. The, uh, and just let me say, uh, the great achievement of the war from the point of the British uh, military was the Harrier jump jet. Uh, that, that achieved massive sales <laughs> After the Falkland War, could, it could take off, uh, uh, take off off, off off a ship quite easily, yeah. uh, and it sort of won the war for us, uh, uh, and that was sold all over the world after the Falkland War. Okay, now a lot of patriotic people will be sitting at home next saying, "What is this? They tried to take over British land, and we came and liberated that land." End right. of story. Yeah. Okay. Let, let's ask. Let's first of all notice that. When the killing war broke out on the 1st and 2nd of May, uh, that uh, first of all, British started shooting people uh, on, the, on the island, 
uh, 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 and then they sunk the Belgrano. So massive deaths occurred on the 1st and 2nd of May, and then British deaths occurred after that, followed on afterwards. Okay? During that weekend, uh, Francis Pym, British uh, uh, Foreign Secretary, and Al Hagwa were negotiating all the time in Washington, trying so to get a peace deal. just go back a step, Nick. How long does it take the task force to get... Well, the best islands. part of a month. A they, month. Come they, they come down during April. Right, so there's the whole of April, you've got these ships on the way to the, the yeah. islands. Yeah. And, and the, the Argentines are there in presence, but they haven't killed anyone yet. Yeah. All right. So we get there. Yeah. And uh, there was this controversy over the sinking of the Belgrano, which triggered the war. Is that right? So well, during that entire month, there were still peace negotiations going on. Is that uh, what you're uh, saying? Absolutely, yeah. Al Haig right. and... Uh, Margaret Thatcher kept, 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 kept rejecting anything Haig said, okay? but she was mandated to listen to him because they couldn't possibly fight the war without American support. And America really, really wanted a peace deal and not a war. Uh -huh. so, so Britain had Margaret Thatcher, maybe she didn't want anything to negotiate. She just wanted a, a jingoistic victory. Okay? But Britain's Foreign Secretary really, really did believe that they could get a negotiating sex, settlement. And when he said, he said on the 1st of May, no further hostilities are envisaged at the moment other than making the total exclusions unsecure. I suggest that is a very important statement. He said the, the shooting on, on Port Stanley uh, that day, 1st of May, was just to concentrate Argentine mines, and it did. As soon as they saw what it was really like to have the British military ar arrive uh, and that they couldn't really see that Marginese had never really had a war before. They, they had all the machismo of wanting the Falkland Lions. They never really had a war. Since they saw what it was like, they basically realised uh, that they're very soon to wanting to n n negotiate. And uh, I, I think there could have been a decent uh, so, peace deal. So Francis Pym, you think he was at odds with Thatcher then? Yeah, that yeah Thatcher didn't like so him So has all. Francis Pym actually written about this since he's retired? He hasn't he, said he's anything. He's not alive now, is he? He hasn't said anything. He just had to swallow the official line right. and, and, uh, and, and, so and get, 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 get over it. Yeah, but, but uh, he was genuinely trying to pull out a, a, a deal at the time. And uh, there was a great optimism, sense of triumph in Peru. And they'd called a press conference. They thought so, they'd got a so, deal. Okay. So where was the task force when this breakthrough would come through? It was hovering uh, a little way off from the Falkland Islands. Right. Uh, and it had arrived. And it, 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 it got the 200 mile exclusion zone. And there were a few. So, oh, just sorry, Nick, to keep interrupting you. When was the exclusion zone? 30th imposed? of April. Uh, 13th of oh, April. Was it 28th? 28th. So this no, is sorry, sorry, 28th of April. It so was, this is when the ships were on the way. We uh, said. Once they arrived at the end of April, then they imposed what they call the total exclusion zone. Any, any, any ship whatsoever inside, or plane inside this area will be, will be shot. Mm -hmm. Will be sunk. Hmm. Right. And. Uh, so you, you're saying that British forces killed some Argentine, Argentinians on the islands. The shelling began on Saturday. Shelling be yeah. began. Yeah. Yeah. And, and how many people were killed there? Well, maybe a couple of dozen. Argentinians? Yeah. yeah. Any British killed? Any British no, casualties? No. Okay. So, and, and then shortly after that, the Belgrano was sunk. Uh, this is the all important fact. So you think when, when, we, when Britain started shelling the islands, they just said, oh, um, we're not, we've never had a war before, let's just, let's just get out of it and surrender straight uh, away. You well, well, saying they were going there to was surrender? an enormous realisation that, they, that a, a negotiated peace deal would be a good idea. Yeah, yeah I think right. it did dawn on them then. So yeah. Argentina said, hey, we, sorry for coming on British land, we want a peace deal. Uh, th that started happening very rapidly right. in Peru. And uh, as far as we can tell, all sides thought there, there was a decent, uh, viable uh, solution here. Uh, this, uh, is after, Pim, this is after some people had been killed, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Right. Pim later denied it. He said there was only proposals there because he had to, he very much towed the British line. But, but uh, I think early evidence showed that in the afternoon of May the 2nd, right. uh, everyone thought they'd got something honourable and decent that both sides could live with. Right, and so this was a, a telephone negotiation with the British Foreign Minister, American Foreign Minister, now, uh, hang on, British foreign, the Foreign Secretary sorry. in in Peru, uh, and uh, he then phoned back someone, he was in telephone conversation with someone in England who later denied it. 
Right. Uh, 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 Thatcher denied having any knowledge so of this. So who was? The, do you know who the person in England was that got yeah, information? Yeah, yeah, on we the do. Yeah, something called Lord Hugh Thomas, who was do with uh, Thatcher's foreign policy uh, advisory group. So he was told there's a peace breakthrough. There's no. We don't need to proceed with this war. Yeah. Ar Argentina are going to back off. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. Uh, so, but Thatcher's denied getting any information from him. Yeah, so. yeah. Right. The point is that the Belgrano was sunk, if we may come on to this now, at the last possible moment when that, uh, when Britain could deny knowing anything about the peace deal. That, that's, that's the way I see it. Right. You see, uh, for a day, on the 1st, the Belgrano it, it kept outside. It had no mission mandate to go inside the exclusion zone, whatever. It was sailing eastwards and it had a sort of radar on it, that's its function, just to see if anything tried to come in to attack the mainland or anything. Uh, and then, uh, on the, uh, very early in the morning of the 2nd, it turned round and started going uh, back westwards again. Mm -hmm. Okay, And that's all it did. Uh, and, uh, and it was outside the exclusion zone yeah, at all times? Yeah, it was about 50 miles outside when it, when it was sunk, and it was heading back towards the Argentine mainland. Uh, and uh, and can I just interrupt? Nick? Were there any other Argentine ships within the exclusion zone at that ab time? Absolutely not. No. And no, there, were there any went. Argentine troops on the islands at that time? Or had well, uh, yes, fighting was going on. Uh, right. Yeah, there were troops on the island. Uh, uh, but, okay. Um, so, uh, for for your viewers who think, look, this was just war, and we shot it, and, and we got the islands back, uh, l let them ask the question. Why did the British government come out with a whole train of untruths about the Belgrano? Why could it never face admitting the, the truth uh, and always say it had to be covered up as the highest matter of national security? Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, if you watch the Diana Gould interview with Thatcher, you'll see everything Thatcher says is untrue. She says it was inside the exclusion zone, or she says it was heading towards the task force, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and it, it wasn't at all. All right, then, Nick, I'll interrupt you there because um, I, I do re that's one thing I do remember about the... Well, it was a few years afterwards, wasn't it, the, the Diana yeah, Gould interview? Years, yeah. But, yeah. Uh, and we'll take a look at that after this break. I'm talking with Nick Collistrom about the Falklands conflict, and we mentioned before the break the... Is it Diane Gould? Or Diana, Diana Gould. Diana Gould interview. Uh, now, she was on a programme called Nationwide, which was being hosted by Sue Lawley, I think, Sue Lawley, Nick. Yeah, yeah, Sue yeah. Lawley and, and Margaret Thatcher, the Prime Minister at the time, was there being questioned about the sinking of the Belgrano. And as Nick said, you're saying that almost everything Thatcher says in this clip is, is not true. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And almost everything or everything Diana Gould says is true. Totally, yeah. yeah. Right, okay, well, yeah. let's just take a look at this clip. Still studio. Mrs Gould, your question, please. Uh, Mrs Thatcher, why, when the uh, Belgrano, the Argentinian mm. battleship, was outside the exclusion zone and actually sailing away from the Falklands, uh, why did you give the orders to sink it? But it was not sailing away from the Falklands. It was in an area which was a danger to our ships and to our people on them. Outside it, the exclusion zone, then? But it was in an area which we had warned at the end of April, we had given warnings that all ships in those areas, if they represented a danger to our ships, were vulnerable. When it was sunk, that ship which we had found was a danger to our ships. My duty was to look after our troops, our ships, our navy. And my goodness me, I live with many, many anxious days uh, and Mrs. nights. Mrs. Thatcher, you started your answer by saying it was not sailing away from the Falklands. It was on a bearing of 280, and it was already west of the Falklands. So I'm sorry, but I cannot see how you can say it was not sailing when away from the Falklands. Was, when it was sunk. When it was sunk. It was a danger to our no, ships. No, but you have just said at the beginning of your answer that it was not sailing away from the Falklands. And I am asking you to correct yes, that statement. but it's within an area outside the exclusion zone, which I think what you are saying is sailing away. I think no, which I'm not, about Mrs. Which way it was facing was at the time. I danger to our ships. Mrs. Thatcher, I am saying that it was on a bearing 280, which is a bearing just north of west. It was already west of the Falklands, and therefore nobody with any imagination can put it sailing other than away from the Falklands. Mrs. 
I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Mrs. Gould. Mrs. Gould. Um, when you know... the orders were given to sink it, and when it was sunk, it was in an area which was a danger yes. to mm. our ships. Well, now, you accept mm. that, do you? Uh, no, well, I don't. I'm sorry, it was, and you, um, must, you must accept uh, no, that Mrs. when Thatcher. we gave the order, when we changed the, ex the, the rules which enabled them to sink Belgrano, the change of rules had been notified at the end of April. It was all published that any ships that were a danger to ours within a certain zone, wider than the Falklands, were likely to be sunk. And again, I do say to you, my duty, and I'm very proud that we put it this way and adhered to it, was to protect the lives of the people in our ships and the enormous numbers of troops that we had down there waiting for landings. I put that duty first. Mrs. And when Thatcher, the Belgrano was Miss... sunk, when the Belgrano was sunk, and I ask you to accept this, she was in a position which was a danger to our Navy. Mrs. Thatcher, Gould, let me, let me ask you this, Mrs. Gould. What, what motive are you seeking to attach to Mrs. Thatcher and her government in this? Is it inefficiency, lack of communication, or well, is it a desire for action, a desire for It war? is a desire for action and a lack of communications because on giving those orders to sink the Belgrano when it was actually sailing away from our fleet and away from the Falklands was in effect sabotaging any possibility of any peace plan succeeding and Mrs Thatcher had 14 hours in which to consider the Peruvian peace plan that was being put forward to her in which those 14 hours those orders could have been rescinded. Right, Mrs Thatcher. One day all of the facts in about 30 years' time will be published. That I lifted is not the ca good enough, Mrs. Thatcher. I am we just... Mrs. Gould, would let, you let, please let Mrs. Thatcher answer. Let me I think answer. You've, you've put a fair point. Would you please let me answer? I lived with the responsibility for a very long time. I answered the question, giving the facts, not anyone's opinions, but the facts. Those Peruvian peace proposals, which were only in outline, did not reach London until after the attack on the Belgrano. That is fact. Uh, Th I'm sorry, that is fact, and I am going to finish. Did not reach London until after the attack on the Belgrano. Moreover, we went on negotiating for another fortnight after that attack. I think it could only be in Britain that a prime minister was accused of sinking an enemy ship that was a danger to our navy, when my main motive was to protect the boys in our navy. That was my main motive, um, and I'm very proud of it. Mrs. Gould, One have day you... all the facts will be revealed, and they will indicate, as I have said. Mrs. Gould, have you got a new point to make? Otherwise, well, I must move just on. Just one point. Um, I understood that the Peruvian peace plans on a, na a nationwide program were uh, discussed on the midnight May the 1st. If the, uh, that outline did not reach London for an, well, another Mrs. 14 Thatcher hours, it didn't. Um, I think there must be something very seriously wrong with our communications, and we are living in a nuclear age when we're going to have minutes to make decisions, not hours. All right, then, Nick. Yeah. And, and Sue Lawley lost her job. And notice the very balanced, even-handed approach of Sue Lawley yeah. in that interview. That was something that, that we gets were her fired. That we were discussing off camera. Nick was saying that... Um, in no television uh, political debate program these days would uh, somebody be allowed to attack a prime minister or a politician as easily as, as Gould did. So, in yeah. other words, the host would normally step in and protect the politician. Yeah. But, we, yeah. but Sue Lawley was, I think Sue Lawley was trying to find out for her own knowledge. Totally, yeah. What, what, totally, what, right, what the nub right. of the question or yeah. the issue was. Yeah. So for me, she, was, she was actually did a good job there, yeah, allowing totally, Thatcher yeah. to, be, totally, yeah. to be questioned. Yeah, right. and, and one point, I think where this is one of the few times where Thatcher really was on the defensive. Not, normally she's quite an aggressive, not aggressive, but a, a very assertive speaker yeah. in control. She wasn't in control in that interview. She was... She was on the rails, basically. Well, she the, had a usual hi hypnotic manner. You do believe this, don't you? You must believe this. Yeah. Of course you believe <laughs> yeah. this. And yeah. Diana just didn't go for it. You yeah, know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think where Thatcher went wrong there, she should have just admitted she was wrong. She should have just said, yes, I, I correct myself. It was sailing away right. fr from, the, from the Falklands. But right. you don't think she was allowed to do that, Nick? Well, well uh, the, the whole story of what the Belgrana was doing got wrapped up by a... <laughs>
devious defence minister Michael Heseltine as being top national security, and it can be called the crown jewels because Clive Ponting was was commissioned by Heseltine to look into it, and he then shipped a whole lot of stuff to Tam Daniel because he thought this is so important, this cover up, and uh, he then got arrested for it. And if you remember, the jury let him off; he was acquitted. Uh, Who got arrested? Uh, Clive Ponting got arrested. Right. Because he, he told Tam Daniel about all this stuff. I see. And, and it like, so it was a, m the usual, it's a matter of national security, so we can't give anyone any, yeah. any information. Yeah. In other words, we can't let anyone see our lies. Yeah, yeah. And, and the jury acquitted Clive Ponting. And that was a major part of the inquiry we held uh, back in 1985 of getting the real story out. Okay, Clive so just Ponting. tell us about that then, Nick. You held an inquiry with... Some very yeah. So at Hampson Town Hall, the Belgrano inquiry, we had a whole lot of people: uh, Tam Daniel, Clive Ponting, Ian, Ian Mercado. So this is what three years after the yeah, conflict. Yeah, okay. and Paul Rogers, the professor of peace studies at, at Bradford University, uh, th these kind of people, and we invited both sides. The government didn't want to send send anybody, uh, and uh, our book was uh, published. Uh, f from that and I think we, we got the story I mean the thing is that we didn't have support from Peru or Argentina of giving their vital documents that, that was that was the, 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 the trouble there, there's a whole lot of details of exactly when who phoned who when and who mm -hmm. agreed to what that, that they were pressured into not Peru was put under pressure not to come out with details of exactly By who well by British sources obviously uh, Britain didn't want them to come out with this story right uh, so you were trying to find out the exact sequence of events in this peace negotiation and when that got back to London and yeah. did it get back to London in time to prevent yeah. the loss of, what, a thousand uh, lives? Yeah, yeah. As, well, it was about uh, 300 or so uh, uh, actually died, Belgrano. Fortunately, of the 1,100 uh, people on the Belgrano, most of them s survived. Right. Um, but as, as Diana Gould says it in that but interview... How, how many died in the entire war? I think it was I think it was a thousand or so. Right. Okay. Um, uh, as Diana Gould says, there was a fourteen-hour period between the Peru uh, announcing or having a peace deal and the decision which Margaret Thatcher made at Chequers to give to authorise right. the, the sinking of the Belgrano. Right. Uh, uh, because of the different time zones, so there, there was a lot of time in which the government had to try and try and deny having any interception. Right. So what is I mean? How does Thatcher? Uh, respond to that? She was asleep or what? Well, they always respond by saying, oh, this is national security, it'll come out in due time, uh, and uh, people get confused about the different time zones. But this utter crap story about the Belgrano being uh, going to attack the task force, this has come out again in the, in the, in the modern uh, official history of the Falklands campaign. So, so that's just right what Sorry. you're saying, Nick. So you, what you're saying is, the, the British Foreign Minister had brokered some kind of peace deal that would have prevented the war, and he was he, he'd phoned London and told told this, and you think Thatcher probably knew this? He had, he had, he had probably phoned London, right? Uh, uh, and exactly who has phoned London is difficult to say because because they could have denied, denied it all. They're, they're denying they're that, that, that they had news of yeah. it, but they probably but, but did have news of it. Obviously, uh, Pym is going to phone London because in London. If he's in Washington with Haig and there's very important negotiations with Argentina and Peru, obviously he's going to tell. So you think Thatcher just said, no, I don't want to know about that peace deal? Because obviously that she'd committed a whole load of troops that were all there ready, yeah. ready, to, yeah. ready to let rip. And she, you think she just went, no, we've got to have this war now. The troops are there. Sink that Belgrano. Yeah. Let's, get, let, let's get it started, chaps. She needed that for the terrific jingoistic let's put the grape back into Britain stuff, on which she got re-elected, and you had then had that, she became the Iron Lady after that, if you remember, yeah. and you never seen so many flags fluttering, British flags everywhere. Um, I mean, you can, you can see the logic in that. Not, I'm not saying that it's correct, but you can, you, you, you can, you can um, understand that kind of mentality whereby if, if she's got to say, okay, lads, no, there's a peace deal, turn your ships around and come back. Yeah. It, it, well, it doesn't look it may very... Not, but um, all I'm saying, for all your, any of your, your viewers who support this, it needed this cowardly act of mass murder, that an old battleship, absolutely no threat to anyone, going home with most of its staff in a cafe or asleep, suddenly getting two torpedoes from a hunter-killing nuclear submarine, 
uh, 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 that was so shocking and such a violation of international law that, that uh, Britain has covered up the facts about it ever since and is still covering it up today. All right, so, so you mentioned international law there, Nick. If it's a violation of that, um, why isn't Thatcher in The Hague on trial with this? Well, these things, that, that they never do try any, uh, any, any European l leaders. But uh, the, the whole thing was supposedly done under a UN uh, resolution, mm -hmm. Article 51, which involved minimal use of force mm -hmm. and, and trying to get a peace deal. And the ministers said, well, we are not at, at war. This is, uh, uh, this is trying to resolve the dispute with minimal force right. uh, and, and that was the principle under which whenever Britain did something that's why they had to get authorization from Chequers or, or from North those are the two British centers of decision making just tell us what the title of the book that you co-edited is Nick. Uh, Abba Grani on inquiry produced this the unnecessary war as an outcome of the uh, the uh, two-day inquiry we held and uh, also I'd like to recommend this little book if you can get hold of it by just, Tam Daliel just hold it up a bit higher. By Tam Daliel Thatcher's Torpedo, which uh, is his speeches at the House of Commons. It was a tireless research by Tam Daliel. So he, he was a Labour MP. Is he, yeah. is he still an MP? No, no, he's long re retired. Uh, uh, and he, he opposed the Falklands War, did he? Well, it was through him that, that the story started coming out. For example, initially the government was saying the decision to sink the Bulgarian was made privately by the submarine commander. Uh, and, and it was only when the submarine... Uh, the, the Conqueror came back to its base in Scotland, that Tam Daliel, a Scottish MP, was able to find out that they actually did it on instructions from Northwards and probably prior, direct instructions from the Thatcher herself. Uh, and uh, Tam Daliel got quite an annoyed at this uh, and uh, started asking questions and finding out the conditions under which it was really sank. Mm -hmm. and, and he came to the conclusion, which I think is fully supportable today, that it was done in order to scupper the peace deal. Now, it, now in the interview that we just watched with uh, Diana Gould and Thatcher, Thatcher says it will come out in 30 years. Yeah. Is that another lie? Well, that's the big question. They're supposed to release stuff in 30 years, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and we're we waiting to see if they will. But so when is it? In, th that will be of this, May? this April, May, yeah. Uh, and uh, clearly this is a big moment. Uh, and the fear is that because of the geopolitical issues now of the great pressure which America is, is putting on Britain to negotiate with Argentina uh, and the total uh, pan-American feeling that, that the British behaviour is outrageous, that, that they may feel pressure not to release things. But uh, I urge British citizens to demand the truth on, the, on this matter. We, mm -hmm. we, we're supposed to live in a democracy. We do have a right to know the truth about this issue and, and why it was necessary for Britain to cover up a whole mass of stuff in the first place. Basically, Britain precipitated war. That's the simplest possible way, way of saying things. You may have said it's unfair Argentina's grabbing the island, but a killing war really began over that weekend, once the Belgrano was sunk, then fierce battle broke out with various British warships being sunk, okay? Uh, and they were sunk in consequence of that Belgrano attack. Mm -hmm. If you just consider the mindset of your average man on the street mm -hmm. who just says, uh, Argentina tried to take over British territory and we took it back yeah. and we had to kill some people in the process. Yeah. End of story. So if they then read in the newspaper that we are now negotiating or, or considering negotiating handing those islands back and there's people who are alive whose, whose sons and daughters or mothers and fathers maybe died in that conflict, they will say, what did my relative die for in that war? This is what they will say, Yeah, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So I can't see how the British government would could come out publicly and say we are now negotiating with Argentina to hand them back. I'm not, I'm not saying whether it's right or wrong whether, right. sorry not handed back but sovereignty transferred at some point in time or at some, fu or some future point. At some future point in uh, time maybe a hundred years yeah. or something that, that, they, that become shared for a period and then what have you, negotiated. Well Richard I, 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 I can't see how any, how your average man on the street would accept that, would accept that our people, well, British people have died and we're now going to 
to even discuss handing them back. Can you see that? Well, we have to learn to live without war in this world. We've got to find other answers than going to war. Uh, and uh, in the long run, having 1,000 people 8,000 miles away from Britain, well, that's quite enormous expense to this country, is just not sustainable. It, it, it's a kind of a absurd situation. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it involves us spending enormously more on those Argentines, r rather sort of bleak, depressing island, than us uh, spent on ordinary people in this country. I mean, why should they be so privileged to have okay. enormous extra budget, military and sustaining and education and health? Well, it, it's, a, it's, it's the British Empire, isn't it? It's, it's a sustaining that what was created well, a the, long time the, ago. Well, the United Nations uh, resolution requested as an end to colonialism that Britain had better uh, negotiate sovereignty on the islands. That's okay. a UN resolution. All right, Nick, I'm going to stop you there and we're going to, we'll, we'll talk more about the, basically the, the ownership uh, of the islands after this. Falklands co conflict. Now, before the break, Nick, we were talking about the ownership of these islands. Now, if let's just say hypothetically that Argentina owned Jersey and Guernsey, or the Isle of Wight for that matter, yeah. would British people be happy with that? Um, would, well, would we, and, and, and if we try to live on them or what have you, send troops there, would we accept the fact that we'd be kicked off by some country on the other side of the planet? Do you see what I'm getting at? Yeah, well I doubt it, and they might take the very logical view that if, if, if you own the place then your ships can't dock on, on Brit in British ports. You know, mm -hmm. there might be that Im implication, which is what South America has now said to the Falkland Island. Falkland Island. You mentioned uh, another island, Nick, that, that Britain has control over. Well, uh, the, uh, the, the islanders of Diego Garcia were simply told to get the hell out of their home by Harold Wilson uh, and shipped off uh, just so Britain could give that island to America as a military base. Right. And, uh, uh, if, if and they if now have approaching 800 military bases all over the world. Yeah, so, so if Britain does that to, why should it do that to Diego Garcia if it's going to give the Falkland Islands the right to be British and, and uh, remain British as long as they want to? Now let's bring in the question of oil, Nick, because there's oil in that region, is there not? Is this not why, the real reason why Britain wants to maintain ownership well, of, of yeah, that area that, that and possibly the water around it. I mean, where does the ownership of the, yeah, th the water end? Is it so many miles out or something? Or, do you know um, I think there is oil being, being found there and developed, and, uh, but it's not very evident that uh, British, British uh, technology by, by itself mm -hmm. can, uh, in, in the very stormy waters of the but uh, as we know, Nick, some of these oil companies, they, they, they span national borders. They're not focused in one particular country. They've got huge resources and vast amounts of money. Yeah. And if they've got the backing of the British government or the American government, then they, they basically won't get the oil, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I would have thought most people would say that uh, any oil down there should belong to the uh, Argentines, uh, n not to Britain. I, I would think it makes sense that oil in that region should be used by Argentina. I can't see any logic whatever the oil in that area being used for Britain, mm -hmm. um, personally. Yeah, Yeah. You, you were telling me about a book that's just come out, Nick, Silent Witness. Well, there's a new one just come out called The Silent Witness by some guy Thorpe who was working in intelligence for the Falkland Islands. And his last chapter, he claims, oh, I actually wrote a report from Margaret Thatcher called The Sinking of the Belgrana. And that report intercepted a hitherto unknown message ordering the Belgrana to turn round and go back into the uh, exclusion zone and attack British ships. Now, this has to be total make-believe. He's doing this just to sell his book and just to give a government-approved position coming up to the 30th anniversary. I mean, you can't have a message uh, suddenly released, which GCHQ would have intercepted, ordering the Belgrano to go back into the exclusion zone. Uh, any such message would have found its way into the, the Crown Jewels document, which Clive Ponting looked at, mm -hmm. uh, and that was, uh, and also if there had been any such message, it would have been absolute manna from heaven for Margaret Thatcher. It would have 
it would have rescued her from all the difficult questions that people were asking her. Mm -hmm. So we've had two books come out now, both pretending to have hitherto unknown order revealed to them, ordering the Belgrano back into the exclusion zone. There's, there's the official history of the Falklands campaign by Sir, Sir Lawrence Friedman, who gets knighted by Tony Blair, right? And then there's this, re this year, the book by Thorpe, um, worked on intelligence during the Falklands War. They're both making this totally unsupportable claim to have, uh, to have secret evidence, which they're not, they're not saying anyone else can have a look at it. It's not in any way visible, this evidence, but it's been disclosed to them, uh, and, and it's used to then ratify the story of their book. Mm. Uh, and uh, I think it's imp important to see this as, as uh, these are fabrications put up to try and, um, uh, try and marginalise and sideline uh, the, the people uh, who are now dismissed as conspiracy theorists who are trying to find out the real reason right. for the sinking of Bangrana. Right. And, and so do you know, ha has the current government, British government, made any statements on the Falklands recently? Well, yeah. Uh, Cameron's uh, engaged in... Uh, uh, he has to respond to America saying... Uh, uh, saying there's negotiations have got to happen. Uh -huh. And obviously the British government is very upset about that. Uh, and Cameron's made some remark about c c colonialism, which is perhaps rather ill-advised. Um, what, can, can you give us the, the gist of his remark? Oh, he was trying to make out the Argentines were being colonialist and wanting to have a claim on the island, which um, I think is ra rather outrageous and it just irritated everybody. Um, but uh, I, I, I think and I hope that some, some stuff will be released uh, over the, uh, uh, at this 30th year anniversary and it will help t to get a real reconciliation and understanding which we need for the future of those islands. Mm -hmm. So do you think that there will be a media turnaround then in terms of uh, perhaps some of this information will come out in the mainstream media in order to move the public to accepting doesn't look like it transfer uh, i'm not that optimistic no, no i think there'll be a whole okay. lot of uh a whole lot of cover-up stories uh and uh endorsing official british machismo yeah um but doesn't that put us at loggerheads with america then by taking that stance do, Mer do you not it, think it america is, yeah. understand the problem that the british government are in not that it's a that it's a problem of their own making because, as you suggest, the war probably could have been avoided and should have been avoided by the sound of, by, from what your evidence suggests. So, um, but America don't really, they're not really bothered about that, you think? Well, they're under pressure. There's South American uh, uh, Confederation. Uh, this is, they this want, is, they this need is good a, relations. All of the South American yeah. countries they're fair, all South, are fairly, sticking together yeah. and saying to America, look, Argentina should eventually, yeah. at some point, either have shared ownership or some timescale totally, transfer. Totally, yeah, yeah. They're all saying that to America, and America yeah. are saying, "Well, I America's under pressure to to accept that." Right. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so what you're saying is that the influence of all of the South American countries is possibly as big as Britain's influence in America. So, therefore, there's this political football, if you like. That's what it looks like. Yeah. Right. Okay. Hmm. So, you, but you, you you can't see that then. The, 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 our government actually start negotiations to, with some kind of time scale for well, either shared ownership yeah, or transfer. I, I, ownership. I haven't got a crystal ball for what's going to happen in politics, Richard. But uh, <laughs> my, my business is to try and get out the true story yeah. of what happened 30 years ago mm -hmm. uh, and why was enormous amount of deception and cover up necessary uh, by the British media and the British government, uh, and, and uh, can we try, try to get the truth of what happened? Yeah, if, I mean, if we can just widen the discussion a little bit, Nick, mm -hmm. I'll just pop a philosophical oh, question. Yeah, right. A philosophical yeah, question, right. and if you just yeah. consider the Earth to be like a dog, and we are fleas living on the dog, uh -huh. the, the fleas draw these lines on the dog, and they call them countries, and they say, "Well, this is our bit of the dog. We're going to live on the ear, <coughs> and there's no way you lot are going to come over here and." share this ear with us, we want you to live on the arse. Right. So, that, so we've split up the planet into these things called countries that we fight over. I mean, yeah. for me, saying that you own or you control or part of the earth belongs to this group because we fought for it 
is a bit like saying that we own the air, the air that we breathe. We're yeah. all on this planet together. I mean, yeah. I, I don't have a problem with everyone sharing the planet, right? Which, which might be considered a globalist agenda. Globalist agenda, yeah. But I, I don't see anything wrong with a globalist agenda as long as it's not done by stealth. Yeah. which is what globalists are trying to do, the likes of Kissinger and Zabrinsky yeah. and what have you. Yeah. They're trying to bring about a global government which is going to be very controlling and, and yeah. uh, you might call it um, communist or, or corporatist, yeah. uh, where the yeah. people don't really have a say and there's an elite yeah. governing right. billions of people. Right. That's what they're trying to bring about. Right. But I would say that there's nothing actually wrong with globalism if it's done with with the will of all of the people, yeah. Because as well, you say, there's no. We need to get rid of war, and, and and no one's ever come up with a solution for getting rid of war. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, if you're looking at a wider perspective, people say, "Oh, Thatcher was right because the Argentine government was so terrible and had massacred so many of its own citizens, mm -hmm. and uh, this fault was more led to this collapse of the Argentine government." Um, uh, and uh, and they're quite glad to. Uh, that she helped get rid of it. So, mm -hmm. I mean, there are different aspects in all this. Uh, and the one thing I, I'm totally committed to is that people want to talk about it. They've got to talk about it on a basis of knowing what really happened. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've got to have transparency. Yeah. We must not have a secret state which can cover up what it did and say, oh, we're not allowing you to reach decisions on the matter. I mean, just about everything you read about the Falklands War now is based on un untrue conceptions. Uh I totally agree, and I've said this many times on my show that that the the statement "it's a matter of national security" is just is just a complete and utter whitewash excuse. It just allows yeah. them yeah. to lie. It allows them to commit crime. Mm. Why, if you published everything about the Falklands, about these messages, how is that threatening national security? Yeah. Is some foreign nation going to attack us because we've published those documents? Of course not. Yeah. It's not really protecting national security it's protecting the people who took those dodgy decisions yeah I mean if we look at one of the most distinguished witnesses we had Clive Ponting uh, uh, I think everyone would like to have him around now and obviously for example if you've got a chance to interview him in the coming months about what happened he was a civil servant he was at the heart of it all and he could give he would have authority that, that, that uh, journalists and politicians would listen to if he were. Now, he's nowhere to be found. We spent a, quite a while trying to contact him, find out where he is. He's somewhere in Bahamas or somewhere. So what was his role in it, Nick? Well, his role was as a senior a civil servant. He was employed by Michael Heseltine to get all the secret dossier together, the crown jewels, and to advise Heseltine about what he could say in public. And he then, as we saw, he then notified Tam Daniel about all this. Right. Uh -uh. So basically, he's effectively knows what happened. Yeah, and he then wrote wow. a book called The Right to Know. Okay, right. R quite and, a lot and of do books. Do you think that was was that an open book, or was he just writing what he was allowed to write? No, that that was about the truth as far as he could find it out. He said the truth is still hidden. That's what he said in his introduction to our book. The so truth he hasn't is still actually hidden. published the full truth then. Well, he doesn't know it. None of us know it. That's the thing. Right. Because so many of these vital telegrams have been deleted and whatever. Right. Um, now, what I'm saying now is that, uh, is that Clive Ponting is not going to appear. I don't think he is. I think he would be in danger if he did step forward now. I think that's the climate we now live in. And there are several other people I could mention who will be totally key witnesses who could come and testify. The media would really listen to them. Uh, I mean, I, I'm just a sort of discredited conspiracy theorist. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I've been mean, called a, a Belgronaut. That's what Belgronaut is. Oh, that's what I've never heard us. that word before. Belgronaut. That's what Lauren Freeman has used to dismiss the, the people who go, go on about it. Yeah. Now, uh, now people who would be totally credible are, 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 are it seems to me, not going to dare to step forward. I think they would be in danger, like Clive Ponting. Uh, and I think he's going to keep well out of the way until this anniversary is over. <laughs> You think Clive Ponting is a closet Belgranaut? That's how you describe him. Well, well if you want, but uh, he, he would. Uh, people who would have authority are, are just not going to step forward now. And instead, you're going to get uh, government cover-up agents to to give um, spin. sort of speeches in spin, spin. Yeah. yeah. You're actually in the process of setting up a website um, covering all of this, Nick, and, and there's various 
audio uh, files and what have you on the site. Yeah, uh, there are two of the Bagrano Action Group still around, Ted Haywood and me, and uh, Ted had amazingly still got uh, all the audio tapes from, the, from, from our inquiry and, and we put them up on the website so you can have the thrill of hearing uh, all these top experts actually speaking about uh, what, what happened right. uh, their understanding. And give us the domain name. Uh, BelgranoInquiry.com Belgrano .com. And there's, that's, you, you're developing that site now so that yeah. people will, can get yeah. information in you. Yeah, for example, I ho hope to get this book up uh, in a Kindle book or something available on, on, on that site. What, a free yeah. download? Or uh, to buy? Uh, well, I'm not sure. It might be free, yeah, right. should, uh, uh, but uh, that's what we're hoping to do, yeah. All right, then, Nick. Well, uh, good luck with that website, and thanks for joining me today.